evening, everybody. Lovely to have um, all of you join us and particularly wonderful to have Kitty joining us all the way from Sierra Leone. And you can see that slide on the screen, the lovely world she comes from. And we're really looking forward to hearing your story, Kitty. Thank you very much. And thank you, Caroline, for setting this up. Pleasure. Kitty, you and I met as a result of the International Society for Music Education, what we call ISME, conference which I was organizing in Pretoria in 1998. And here you'll see on our next slide various of the ISME conference materials uh, from that conference. 22 years later, you may still remember these materials and the logo which we used in various ways. And this was the first African ISMI conference in the history of our subject association, which was founded in 1953. And you were also the only delegate from Sierra Leone, so you were very special to us, just as for us now, contact with you is special from the village of Hermanus, as we like to call it, where there are very few of our members who know much, if anything, uh, of your country. So when people saw you attended, that's in inverted commas, a recent Zoom session I offered on autistic senior citizenship, they thought it was an ideal opportunity for us at the southern tip of Africa to learn more about you in the west of our continent, because U3A is all about active learning. Could you start, please, by telling us how you came from Singapore to find yourself in Sierra Leone? Okay, that's an easy question. I, at the age of 18, I decided that I wanted to go and study abroad. At first, I gained admission into Trinity College in Dublin to study economics, and then I also wanted to, to study, continue the study of music, my piano studies particularly. So my father at that time decided that Dublin was a safer place than England, in, in London, for example. So, and he had somebody there who would sort of guide me. And so I went and I, I did get admission into Trinity College in Dublin, but the professors there said that if I wanted to do music and economics at that level, I needed to choose because I wouldn't be able to cope. So I decided then that I would go for music. So that's how I ended up there. And I, I did many years in Dublin and I finished my studies there. And there I met my husband, he was from Sierra Leone and I was the secretary of the Malaysian Singapore, Malaya that in those days it was still Malaya, Malaya Singapore Students Association. And he was president of the Sierra Leone Students Association. There was a, a group in Ireland called La Kela, which means friendship. And there, these were Irish people who were beautiful, loving people, and they particularly wanted to look after foreign students because we were all far from home and they wanted to show their friendship and love, love by organizing activities so that we could get together and get to know the Irish people and get to know ourselves. So they had a meeting with the president of Ireland uh, that's always on the calendar where he invites the top executive of these various students organizations. And that was at his official residence, Aras Arnukura. So we met there, my husband and I. That was just like a casual meeting. And as luck would have it, as fate would have it, we met again where we were both asked to give talks on our various countries. So he picked me up, gave me a ride because he had a car in those days and I didn't. So he, he took me to the, the venue and we gave our various talks. And then an on another occasion, this Malaysia Students Association organized a ball 
and I wanted to sell tickets. So I sold him a ticket, a few tickets actually, because he had some friends. So he came. And it's from then on that our courtship started, et cetera, et cetera. And it ended up that we got married in Dublin uh, after he finished his medical degree. And then a year later after his housemanship, because his mother wasn't very well, we decided to come back to Sierra Leone so that she would have the immense satisfaction of welcoming back her son who is qualified as a medical doctor into the society, into the family, etc. So it, we did that. That's how I came back to Sierra Leone. We came on a ship. We came uh, one of those ships that plied the route from Liverpool to Freetown. We brought all the children and the, the belongings, etc., <laughs> to Freetown, and that's how I came. And and it's it's I've been here ever since 1970s when we came. So I've been 50 years here, off and on. And so, Kitty, uh, you've already told us about your uh, studies in uh, Dublin, but uh, obviously you have also studied uh, at major institutions like uh, York University, where you obtained your doctorate. And you have taught and held leadership and administrative positions in countries as diverse as England, Ghana, Ireland, Somalia, and the USA. And for safety's sake, I list them alphabetically, so in no priority order. But am I right that you would feel that one of your greatest achievements has been the founding of the Belanta Academy of Music in 1995. Uh, we see a slide of the front of the building there. And as you wrote to me, and I quote, it is now Belanta Academy of Music and Performing Arts. Our side and board has not changed yet. We've hit hard times now with COVID. So even with the change of name, we are waiting until we get some more income before we can change the signboard. And I'm hoping that you'll tell us now something about being um, the uh, principal of the Belanta Academy, and then I will follow that with some photos that you sent me of the work that you do there at the Academy. Yes. Um, yes, the Academy looks just the same as you see it on the, on the screen right now. This is rented from the Freetown City Council. It's a rented premises. And they've given it to us at a very, very affordable rent for us. So it's their contribution to our work. The school offers many different instrumental studies, like piano, organ, keyboard, guitar, saxophone, all the brass instruments, the, the drum kit and African instruments, as well as dance. We now offer dance as well. We have very incredible dance teachers right now. So the students come in like they, they, they register for a, like a private lesson, so to speak, on a one-to-one -one basis. And then they come again for theory lessons in a group. And so we charge very, very minimal fees because if we didn't, nobody would come. So because the average income is very low and we don't want to cater to the elite. We want to make sure that people come into us because they want to study. And, not, and, and we'd also look for scholarships for those who are talented but cannot afford the fees. So. That's how we operate. And right now we have a staff of five teachers in, in various subjects. And we have just an admin, admin staff of two right now. We, we don't have a finance officer right now because we, we, we are looking for one. Now to augment our income, this, this uh, lower ground floor where you see the two blue doors, we have rented it to cafe to make it into a cafe to, to a lady called Nemuna Jane, and she's going to renovate and make it into a cafe. And behind the building, which you can't see right now from this picture, 
there's a space, a, quite a big space. Um, it used to be just a garage, but we we roofed it, and we used to have what we call buffa. Buffa is like a little hut. We call it Balanta Buffa. That means every last Friday of the month, we would hold events there like an open mic thing, and we would showcase our own students there as well, and others who, were, who would want to come and perform. And that we are now making it a little bit more formal looking, i.e. we created more wall, a higher wall and some toilets there so that we can actually make it into a little mini auditorium as a performing space. That's the construction is ongoing right now. So those are two income bringing structures. So because we struggle, we really struggle for income. We're supposed to get a government subvention, which is very little. And it's supposed to come to us every quarter, but in actual practice, maybe we get one quarter or two if we're lucky. And that's the main source. And we also get a grant from it's a betting business and they give us a small grant. And apart from that, we try to raise funds with, with performances we have a, a musical band a band called groovy colors and it's an electronic band mainly and it plays um, popular music african music reggae and they're into their own compositions now we also have a, fa a brass ensemble called five star brass and uh, they're quite good we also have uh, junior versions of those two. The students who are learning those instruments have their own group. And we have a choir called the Balanta Music Makers, which right now is not functioning because of COVID. So those are the three main groups that we have in operating that when they perform or are hired, bring in a little income because we have to keep some of the, the income for us and some to them. So it's, it's not a lot of money. And apart from these, that's about how we get our income. Sure, but you wrote to me that when you sent this group to the ISMI conference, I referred to ISMI earlier, uh, it was the ISMI conference in Kuala Lumpur in 2006. You said this was a major achievement for us. And You've spoken about the fact that you also have dance, and clearly this was a group performing African slash traditional Sierra Leonean music and dance. And I imagine that that is what you would get your most uh, hard won funding and credit for. And you would know, as I do, that it is what the rest of the world is looking for from us in Africa. And yet these photos that you sent me, these following three slides, respectively of a group music theory lesson in your main teaching room, of you yourself teaching the piano, and then of your German volunteer, Stephen Floor playing his horn. All of these uh, videos relate to the teaching of Western music as we in South Africa are all very well accustomed to. In this video that you sent me, we also experienced some non-African traditional music.
we can see the traditional instruments on the wall behind and yet the the singing is clearly of a western style of music so can you tell us to what extent within Atlanta you accommodate and promote Sierra Leonean folk music alongside Western music? Yes, personally, I would really like to see a lot more of African music, Sierra Leonean music in the academy. Because we are in the city, we do not have the uh, the, the what uh, enabling environment to nurture the traditional instruments and uh, and and singing etc that's very much more uh, common outside the city if you go outside and you go to the provinces Bo, Kenema and so on you will get a lot more of the traditional music being practiced and being part of life but because we're in a city all the other modern contemporary and modern influences are here and the, the the biggest influence here is the church and then of course the popular music which they listen to hip-hop etc rap and afrobeat etc So traditional music is a very, very small desire for them. They just sort of take it for granted that it is not, uh, it, it, it is for people outside Freetown. So they just don't feel that they want to learn that. And it's only foreigners and people who, are, who particularly want to learn that, that come and asking for this kind of studies. But we started at Valanta having a project called Outreach for the schools around us. These are municipal schools, which are really like the, the public schools in the, in the primary ch school children. And we had a teacher who is half based in England and half based here. He's a Sierra Leonean, ex excellent drummer and teacher of, of Sierra Leonean music. So we got him and I wrote up a project for him to, to work with these children to particularly teach them African music, the songs and dances. So we did that and the children were so, so happy to do that and they were unnatural at it. So my dilemma, and it is a dilemma because I, I just feel that it should develop more and more, but it doesn't happen easily. And recently we went to the uh, Minister of Education, Basic Education, and explained to him that we really need the government to help because if the government uh, said that we should have this in all schools that all the children must have classes in traditional music then it would happen and fortunately we have a very listening uh, minister and he has agreed to reintroduce what used to be called the schools and colleges annual festival of the arts this was a whole nationwide festival and it was very success, successful in the years gone by which and somehow they stopped it and it it meant that everybody had to do something traditional sing dance tell stories etc do do skits and so on with the, with the traditional elements in it so if he does that, when he does that, this element will be very much stronger. And it is only with that input that this aspect of our music can really be revitalized and developed. Without that, it's not going to happen, e even in our academy, unless it's really a pro proper project to do, to do this. 
And it's a pity because I keep telling all my staff, your music is the most important thing. It's not Western music that's going to put you on the map. And look at how Sierra Leone used to be on the map years ago for a positive image. We used to have a very well-known dance troupe that went all over the world. This was in the years when the, I remember the Duke of Edinburgh. He was a, lot, a young person at that time, and he used to say really complimentary things about this group. And it was very well known, and it, it put the, the Sierra Leone on the map because of its culture. But nowadays, of course, Sierra Leone is known for other things which are not so positive, which is a shame. So we need to really work on that aspect of our music, Caroline. I, am, I, I, I will always say that to them, that you need to, 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 to work on this. And this is why, my, on my own, I have written books, two books, uh, to, to just fill in this gap, because I feel that nobody's doing it, and it needs to be done because and and even with that um only a few people <laughs> realize its value here so uh, this is a, a problem uh, caroline and it i wish it could be better to answer well, you we will have a look at your books later but well, here are two uh, videos that you sent me from a website of yes. uh, sierra leone heritage and i wonder if we could just look at a bit of each of them to give an idea to the people participating this morning. Now the Kube music originated from the West Indies. This dancing is more, done more in fleet and the Kube dance and it was normally done at wedding parties by the Creoles. So I use this instrument what they call marakash. It's the one of the instruments where they back up the African kumbi. So I will show this man. And they back up the instruments. And you see when women dance, they lift the the tip of the skirt to show the petticoat at the bottom. Well, in Sion, we spell Gumbe G O O M B A Y. In Nigeria, they spell it G U M B A Y. Gumbe music, as I said, was is was played in wedding parties, not pop music. 
Although now pop music has taken over the Gumbe, and those who are good Gumbe players. slide it shows the um, title of the website Sierra, Sierra Leone Heritage .org, and some pictures of different groups um, Kitty we know that uh, the two videos that we've shown excerpts from were both done by you and a young colleague together with others in the gallery of um, uh, videos on this website and it gives some idea of the kind of musical cultures among Sierra Leonean traditions but there are many more of these fascinating short programs and absolute treasure trove and there is the uh, website address for anybody who would like to pursue that further but I'd also like us to look at and listen to a performance of one of your many compositions and arrangements called Maringa Christmas. Um, there are other versions available, but this one is by the Vancouver Choir. And not only does that show the extent to which your work is performed around the world, but it also demonstrates to me what looks like a very westernized, sanitized version of the song and its accompanying movements what we are often accused of in South Africa when Caucasian type choirs attempt to present indigenous African music. So if we can just have a look at, um, at and a listen to this brief, a brief bit from this video. <laughs> Merry Christmas, 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 Merry
Thank you. I think a lot of people in South Africa will relate to that and also to this uh, photo which you told me was of one of your main school bands about to play at the funeral of their bandmaster who passed away recently and their instruments are draped in black as a sign of their mourning. And such school bands are a feature of music activity in your country. But this looks very Western in one sense, yet it also has aspects relevant to and reflective of your particular cultures, just as in South Africa, we have quite a strong movement of uh, field bands. Uh, we can now look at a picture of you donating copies of each of your books to the Sierra Leone Library Board, to the Chief Librarian and his deputy. And the two books being shown in the photo are uh, musical instruments and spirit masks of Sierra Leone, and then one called Milo and all that jazz. But apart from your published compositions, you've also written articles and produced educational texts, and you were responsible for the education section of the draft cultural policy for your country. But I think for our audience, what would be most interesting now is to hear something about the importance and the tradition of masks in Sierra Leone. The masks are the spirits of the society that they belong to. Society meaning the group of people, could be male, could be female, that have uh, rituals and traditions of their own. The societies, there's the male one is called the Poro Society, the female is called the Bundu Society. And uh, what they do, they take the young person, say between 12 and 18. Traditionally, they would take them into what we call the bush. Um, they have a shrine and they have an area which is very sacred to them. And they teach them all the craft and skills of survival and being part of the society. For the women, for example, they would teach them how to be a good wife, how to cook, how to sing, and how to bring up the children and do other things that a, a woman would need to know. So they prepare them for womanhood, in other words, the young girl. Then, so when they finish that, uh, that it's a, it's a kind of a bush school, if you like to call it that way. They used to spend a, a few months in that. When they finish, then they are outdoor. They come out. And this is when the mask comes out. The female mask would then come out in front of the, the, the initiates, we call them. And they would come in, out into the general village area and sing and dance and celebrate the fact that they have achieved something. So the mask in the female society leads the singers and there's dancing and singing and uh, and so on. The same thing with the male society, they, the mask also represents the spirit of their that society. Now the male societies have different masks. It's a, quite a feature of the society here. And then they also have masks which are brought over from Nigeria like the one you saw uh, on the screen, the one with the, with the animal head, uh, that, that's part of what they call the hunting society, not part, it's an offshoot. The hunting society comes from Nigeria. And after the hunt is uh, over, they, they would celebrate and they would, don they would make this mask and bring out the, the hunters and so on in a celebratory parade. Uh, so now, on nowadays, it's just a symbol of that. They don't have a real gun. They just have a fake gun and they have the mask. Well, now then, from that hunter society comes this Odele society, which you saw on the screen, which is more recreational. Uh, that is, um, the Odele would be processing the various Odele masks. They would, the, each little group, they would make their own masks. They always have an animal and, and things like shells uh, and snail shells, uh, cowrie shells, animal skin, etc. on the mask. And they would make their own mask to which they would then sing and dance in their own group in a procession. So you'd have a procession of different masks with their followers and their instruments behind them 
on the feast day. They would come out maybe twice a year. They, that's why the, the commentator said it was only for processing. They wouldn't stand in an area to perform, i.e. perform meaning stand there and dance and sing their whatever the repertoire would be. So they would, this orderly would just process and everybody in the street would come out. It's like a carnival, really, our version of a carnival with that. So that, that's where the masks and that's how the masks work in the society. And Kitty, I think that uh, those masks, those processions would obviously be things that tourists coming to Sierra Leone would want to see. And so I was wondering if we can move on to the topic of tourism. And we have a whole lot of photos now, uh, ones that you sent through to us, uh, such as the one that formed the title slide of the presentation, which was from your famous uh, Bobo Beach. And then uh, you've sent us other photos which you yourself took and which I think uh, Gert can now start to show us one uh, fairly quickly after the other photos of uh, Freetown. Um, of your uh, tropical location. We can see the vegetation in between the urban development. Um, we can see uh, things like your uh, water taxis. That's another one of uh, Freetown there, the water taxis. And we can see um, more of the uh, mountainous landscape there and the beach and other beautiful beaches you spoke about. And then um, there is also your Lion Mountain, which is very famous where the uh, Sierra Leone uh, name came from. Some of these pictures Gert also found on the uh, internet from us. Some are photos that you took personally, like this one, where you said that there was the, um, the red seaweed, which comes in at a certain time of the year. And, and we have something similar here on our beaches, which we call kelp. And that's another lovely uh, photo. Before we move on to something of the uh, architecture, you can see the colonial style architecture. Uh, more of the architecture in the next slide, but this one uh, shows the cotton tree, the very large uh, cotton tree, which you told me is an icon of free town and uh, more than 200 years old and standing in the middle of the city. The cotton tree is an historic symbol of free town. The first group of settlers from Britain, made up of mostly former slaves, arrived in 1787. These black loyalist settlers, called Nova Scotians, founded Freetown on the 11th of March 1792. They landed on the shoreline and walked up to a giant tree and held a thanksgiving service there, gathering around the tree in a large group and praying and singing hymns to thank God for their deliverance to a free land. They gave the capital the name it bears today, Freetown. Even today, Sierra Leoneans still pray and make offerings to their ancestors for peace and prosperity beneath the cotton tree. So we see the cotton tree there, and then we see another one of the uh, colonial buildings, very Western style building. And here we see the outside of one of your big markets where they sell all sorts of basketry and beads and fabrics and uh, everything targeted towards the tourist. But I gather that this picture is of the outside of your big market and two of the paintings of national heroes uh, are depicted. So I hope that you can tell us a little bit now about tourism in your country because that is one of the good news aspects. Yes. Uh, certainly. We have a beautiful country. It is really very beautiful, naturally. The hills that you see are, are all part of Freetown. Freetown is built along the, on the hills. That's why our airport could not be here. It had to be over the river at a place called Lungi. And that's why we need the water taxi to cross from Freetown to the airport. 
So every traveler need, can, needs to do that. You can go overland now, but it will take you like a three and a half hour drive to get to the airport from Freetown. The hills are lovely, but they are difficult to access for the traveler who comes to Freetown. So you need to always be prepared for that extra journey when you land at the airport. The beaches are the main, main attraction that we have here. And if you are a beach lover, this is a really great place for you. But it's all undeveloped, except for the Lumley Beach, the, the one where you saw the seaweed, that's a long stretch of beach there, where they have restaurants and so on, like a promenade, you can walk all up and down that beach. And very often people who do sponsored walks do, do that route because it's quite a challenge to walk all the way. Then we have a museum, which is a very small museum. It's behind that cotton tree. It's where the cotton tree is, just a little short building there. We have the Takugama Chimpanzee re Sanctuary. It's worth going to. It's a, got a lovely collection of chimps and a great place to, to visit. We also have one or two islands that you can visit, Banana Island, and there's Buns Island. Buns is very famous for because it was the, the place where they transshipped the slaves in those days. The ruins of a fort there, and again, to get to Buns Island, you have to take a, a boat. And there is no, it's, it's developed a little bit now. They've tried to restore a little bit of the ruins, and they have a jetty now, which you can get off the boat from before we used to have to go with a little a motorboat and you'd have to be carried over <laughs> one by one onto the onto the island because there was no safe jetty to walk on to get to the island but buns is also very interesting and there's a lovely history behind it although sad so one or two places where you can see the pygmy hippo and other wildlife and of course you have a whole lot of fabrics that you can buy from here, which are really, really very different from everywhere else. This tie dye that they make here in, 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 in Sierra Leone is very different from what you get in other countries along West Africa. It's very, very nice. Um, they do it on damask, cotton damask, and they, they are very skillful at it and produce really vibrant designs and so on. That's one thing you can buy. And of course they have the local bead industry, basketry, not a whole lot. I think Ghana does a little better than us in that, way, in that line, but we are smaller than Ghana, of course. And carvings, we also have some carvings. Before we come to the end of our time, I have to show people the beautiful picture of you and your husband and your wedding. And you also sent me this following slide about which you wrote, main Muslim elders escorting the Imam in my husband's community after the eight prayers. And would you tell us something please about your husband, the position he held in your society and whether that was perhaps the reason that at a point your house was burned down during the rebel war? because with all those bad things that have happened to you and now with your children and grandchildren spread around the world, I think we wonder, since your husband's passing, what actually keeps you living in Freetown? My, my late husband was a medical doctor for many years in private practice, but he also was very active in his own community. He comes from a community called Fuller town, which is in the older part of Freetown. And uh, all these people you see on the screen are his elders in respect of religion. And also some of them are his relatives. He has so many relatives up to now. I don't know. I don't know them all, but they are all Muslims. Most of them are Muslim. He was what they call an Al-Qadi in the society at the time of his passing. In other words, he was like a chief. They elected him as Al-Qadi. That role meant that he would be an arbiter, is that what you call it? When, when there's some disputes in your family, for example, if there's a divorce coming up, he would sit there and mediate and listen to you, etc. That's one of the things he did. He was also a very keen golfer and he was president of the golf club for three years in running this was in the, the days gone by 
And he was also an electoral commissioner for the city of Freetown, what we call the Western area. He was in that position when the rebel wars started. Because he was in that position, he was a target. So we had to leave the country. This is the house which we had before. This, we are still in the same plot, but this is a different house. One of the rebel leaders entered the house and they stayed here. When the ECOWAS, ECOMOG, this is the West African military force that was helping Sierra Leone at that time. When they pushed the rebels out and uh, they all left the house, but we believe that they had stock, a stock of ammunition. They carried what they could with them, but they, with what they couldn't carry, they torched. And so the house went up in flames and there were neighbors said they heard explosions, etc. So the house was totally wrecked. We left the house in that state for a few years because we couldn't take it. It was a difficult thing to accept, but life has to carry on. My husband used to say, they can take everything we have, but we still have our lives and we carry on. So with the help of the children, we rebuilt the house into a two flats this time. And I'm in the top flat now. So, so that's what happened. But what keeps me here? First of all, I still, I, I find that I can still be of help to people who want to learn music. Uh, I still have students, but I'm hoping that that can be a less, a less and less, I see, duty obligation on my part. But I enjoy teaching. My husband left a few properties and because my children are all away except for one, I still have to supervise those uh, properties. That's another reason. So, so those are the two big reasons. And I have one one of my children here and he needs a little help with, with his family. That's the third reason. So um, that's what keeps me here, Caroline. You brought up your family in Sierra Leone and became customs for your household as well. Yes, of course. You know, four children were brought up here until they reached the end of secondary school. I, I, happy to know that they are well grounded in the culture here and the food etc because it's, a, it's of, of the fact that it's a mixed marriage they need to be grounded in one of our cultures so that they they know that they have that at least as their background kitty may i ask you is the country mostly christian or muslim half and half we we have a great great reputation for being religiously tolerant. The, both the religions, they intermingle very easily without any problem. And there are intermarriages between those very frequently. You would get a wedding where they would go to the mosque and they would go to the church. And they would then be blessed in both ways. And everybody then enjoys the festivities in both styles so it's very very tolerant yeah you get a relative who is the husband is muslim and the wife is christian i know many many couples like that and uh, kitty what happens then uh, after that blessing by both religions in terms of the upbringing of the children is there more of a tradition that children should follow the religion of their mother or of their father or uh, are children informed about both? How is that aspect handled? I think, well, maybe it's different from family to family. It just depends if it's, if it's the mother that's really bringing up the children, then they will follow whatever the mother does. So right now I know my, my nephew God is say, Muslim and his wife is Christian. Um, and she takes them to church, the children to church on a Sunday. And when the festival the feast days come, the Muslim feast days come, they all go to the mosque, <laughs> wife and all. Thank you, Kitty, for all that you've so generously shared with us. And I'm sure that those people listening today here in South Africa may feel that they've become aware of more similarities between our society and yours than they previously would have thought. 
And for anyone here locally who has visited our house in Ornris or would care to do so, I have a constant and wonderful reminder of Sierra Leone in this beautiful uh, batik on the damask cloth, as you refer to it, that you gave me as a little piece of folded material before we had it framed. And since then, we've had so much pleasure from it and so have many of our guests. So thank you again for that. And I am prepared to answer questions now, and I think there are going to be a lot of them. So I thought that we should end with it against the background uh, or the backdrop of your national flag. And hopefully after this session, everyone will also remember the flag of Sierra Leone and they would probably not previously have even been aware of that. So I do hope that you can now feel the questions that will be coming in. Thank you, Kitty. Thank you very much, Carolyn. I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you and Gert for putting the, the, the whole whole uh, PowerPoint together. You did it so well, so well. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. What a very, very interesting talk we've had with you this morning. I'm so grateful that you were able to join us. Thank you for that. Thank I'll, you. That's all I'll say for the moment. I'm sure other people will want to ask you questions, but that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Kitty, may I ask you, your neighboring country, Liberia, had a female president in the person of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Has her presidency had any influence on the status of women in your country? Maybe it has. We now have a movement called 50-50. It was started by, again, another relative of ours. Dr. Nimata Majex Walker. It's a movement where they want equal representation, first of all, um, that the women should be just as good as the men. Whatever you want to do, 50 50 must work. So they, they are, that probably is an influence from the Liberian president, yes. That's going strong, actually. They, they've done very well. They've managed to get funding, they now have a building, and they have programs and they try to give uh, projects and, and do work with women who want to hold political positions to prepare them for uh, MPs, uh, be, you know, being voted in for local councils, etc. So yes, more, more, more in the political scene, they're, they're concerned that women need to take part. And although they, they're supposed to have a 30% representation, that hasn't re reached that mark yet. So they have a, still a long way to go. I've got a question for you. Uh, with your husband in the medical field, malaria, the mosquito at one stage was a kind of national symbol for Sierra Leone because it got rid of the Europeans because of malaria. Is malaria a big problem still in Sierra Leone? Yes, it is very much so. It is still a big problem. They've been distributing mosquito nets free as much as they can. Lots of mosquito nets have been going around. But they haven't done anything with regards to spraying because I know in Singapore we used to do, we, we always saw health inspectors and health officials coming to spray the compound and check whether you had a container with water, stagnant water in it, etc. But here, my husband used to say that they, in his day, they used to have people coming around to inspect, just like in Singapore, whether you're, you had containers, stagnant water, but except for the mosquito nets, and um, they also have drugs that they offer supposedly free to people in the hospitals who are under eight, under five, under five I think they give them free drugs um, for malaria, etc. Yes, malaria is also still here, Thank I'm you. afraid. Hi, Kitty and Caroline. Thank you for an extremely interesting talk. It was wonderful. May I ask Kate if you could put that um, website up again for me? I didn't get it all down while it was up. But thank you again. It was extremely interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. And if I could just extend on that, um, your civil war or, or rebel war was obviously devastating for the country. I mean, it, it, it has the country and the, the political situation managed to reorganize and start developing the potential of the country again? Um, yes, of course, that is uh, 
there are many lessons to, le to, to be learned from that. They produced a very comprehensive report on why it happened, etc. Um, the country is trying its best to get up again, but it's, it's not going to be easy. The political parties, there are two main political parties here, and they're, they're always polarized. So when one is in power, the other, everybody belonging to the other one is marginalized, etc. And keep doing this all the time. And as far as I can see, if that continues, it's not going to help until they learn to be, um, you know, accommodating. Accommodating. Thank you, of, mm. of, of each other. Secondly. The, the, the level of education is very low and the, the, the level of literacy is also very low. And that's a, for me, that's a very big problem because mm -hmm. there are so many youth, quite a big percentage of youth here who are not, not in jobs and are frustrated and they have energy, but they're not channeled and they all want to come to the city, which to me is a big mistake. They should try to give them all something to do outside the city because there's a lot of land outside the city and a lot of work to do but for some reason they seem to want to come to freetown and when when they come to the city they get they get bogged down with all kinds of difficulties with smoking and uh, trading they they can't survive as they they would if they went to the provinces because food is a lot cheaper up there and the air is much better and life is a lot more uh, social and 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 friendly and uh, you know so it's it's not helping uh, if that answers your question thank you i don't want to delve into the war either but i do want to ask you a question there were reports of so many amputees mm -hmm. during the uh, conflict has that yes. somehow been resolved or improved no <laughs> the amputees are very very visible and um, they they wherever they can they give them prosthetics um, but there are a lot of beggars. They, 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 they just end up in the street. They're on wheelchairs, they're on crutches, etc. And they all, most of them I see in Freetown. I don't know whether there are the same number outside of Freetown, but I would imagine there are still some there. But they are still very evident. It's very sad. In some West African countries, there's a difference between those who have always been in the country and those that are returned slaves. Is that an issue in your country too? No, no, there's no issue like that at all. They've assimilated very nicely. There's no, there's no talk about that at all, no reference to that. You mentioned golf, your husband having been president of the golf club, and we have lots of keen golfers in our U3A, and I was wondering, you didn't mention golf under the question of tourism. Is golf a, a popular activity in Sierra Leone? Um, to, <laughs> not really. It's only in Freetown that you get, get a golf course, and it's a beautiful golf course. It's right on the water where you see that Longley Beach. It's, it's right there. It's a, it's a beautiful location. It started off as a nine-hole course, but then they, they somehow designed it, um, they, they re-plotted it, and it's now an 18-hole golf course. We don't have any golf carts, everybody walks, and everybody takes a caddy. It could be a tourist uh, place. If you play golf, you can always come and pay guest fees, but it's not a popular sport amongst people. The, the popular one, of course, is football. They're trying to nurture a young you know the young people to play golf um, so but it's not not really something that they see on television or, or that, that you know people they can't afford it for one thing that's it the, the fees are very high and they do give scholarships but not that many you can play golf here sure <laughs> you better get a golf um, group and uh, musical group going Caroline to um, Sierra Leone well, in this house alone, we've got a group of two ready to go. All right. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Kitty, the dance group you referred to that became world famous, what kind of dances did they perform? Oh, they performed traditional dances from the various tribes or ethnic groups, as we call them now. They have uh, instruments from those ethnic groups. And, and before I forget, each paramount chief, and they have paramount chiefs outside Freetown, 
they have their own troupe of dancers and musicians. The dance troupe was originally got together by a, a man called John Akar, and he traveled the whole of Sierra Leone to find the best dancers and the best instrumentalists. And when he got those, he brought them into Freetown. They built a cultural village in, in a place called Aberdeen, by the way. And they, <laughs> and they, they housed them there. And um, that was the, the day, that, that was their heyday. That was the days, they, they were really very good. They had a beautiful routine. And they would, uh, even for local people here, they would perform every Sunday at one of the hotels and uh, we would go there and watch them for free and there was be, be a commentary and they would perform dances and they would perform acrobatic stunts as well and um yes that's what the group the troupe was and and in those other days gone by they actually when they went abroad they danced uh bare-breasted with a netting over their breasts and i think that was people remember that more than anything else that they were attracted <laughs> by these beautiful dances and and they were young girls and they were you know very 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 skillful and now un unfortunately this dance troupe is there now but not organized like it used to be and in fact i feel very very sorry for them that it, it, they seem to be neglected and they're trying to i mean when you want them to 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 do something you have to hire them for, uh, you know privately and so on and so forth but they're very skillful very skillful The carnivals in South America are related to the period just before Lent. The carnivals that you talked about in your country, are, are they connected to any particular event or tradition? Or what are the occasions they hold these carnivals? They, they would be in the Muslim, the Eid, that they would, that they would come out there. And there's, uh, I forgot to mention, there is another type of float procession. It's a float procession, which we do, they used to do it the day of the last day before the Eid al-Fitri celebration. That's when they fast during the month of Ramadan. But now, because the, that festival keeps shifting, and, 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 and it's a float procession of, of floats, um, they would build a float and uh, they would process with it, uh, with a group singing behind them, uh, their own songs and with their own instruments. But because of the weather and the fact that sometime this feast would shift into the rainy season, they decided to put it at Independence Day for, for as a celebration part of the, the Independence Day, which is the 27th of April. So now, unfortunately, the, um, the float procession is still there, but the singing groups, they now replace them with music sets, i.e. the speakers and the DJs and so on, which I find really, really disappointing because the human element has is disappearing. And those songs were really wonderful. And Caroline, that, that um, batik that I gave you shows the, the instruments that they used in this particular procession. They used to call, this is called a lantern parade because they built these floats with biblical um, or national con uh, 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 character, and they would light them up. So they would only come out in the late evening and the whole city would just come to watch.
those are are the um, what they call canes, bamboo canes of different lengths. The whole music that they play is called bubu, b u b u. And those canes would, of course, as you know, they they each of them produces a single note, and because of the different lengths, they, they put them together into the melodies. And then they have the shakers. These are the shakers um, that this guy is wielding up there. And then the drum, the, that the, the different types of drums, and this the square, uh, square kind of a malimba kind of dr uh, instrument. That's all part of the bubuku that goes behind the lamp, each lantern. Uh, in those days, and it was a competition. They would get a prize for the best lantern. Well, knowing that makes it even more special for me. Any more questions? Caroline, you want to wrap it up? Well, just well, to thank you again. And uh, for, for making us aware of so much that we knew very little about it if I can speak for myself and speak for others too. So thank you for being up so early on a Monday morning with the time difference between us and you and being prepared to share with us. Thank you and goodbye to everyone. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> it's been my pleasure and I, I'm glad I was able to answer all, all your questions and uh, it's been a pleasure to showcase Sierra Leone to you all. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very much, Kitty. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Thank you.